It's an honor for me to introduce Mr. Hugh Hardy, FAIA, one of the founding principals of Hardy, Holtzman, and Pfeiffer, which was established in New York City in 1964, and I especially want to thank him for braving the elements. Although I think a week ago we may not have had the pleasure to have Mr. Hardy with us given the blizzard that went through New York. I think many of you know that the firm and Mr. Hardy as an individual have gained international prominence for their work, and very uniquely it is work that has been built around precedent-setting buildings, and some of you probably know the two in Columbus, Indiana, the Columbus Occupational Health Center and the Mount Healthy School, done in the early 70s, and outstanding rehabilitation projects such as the New Amsterdam Theater, Radio City Music Hall, New York City's Cooper Hewitt Museum of Design, and the Los Angeles Public Library, which also had a significant addition onto it as well. The latter body of work will obviously be the focus of Mr. Hardy's lecture this evening. Now, I went back to the February 1981 issue of AIA Journal, which was the issue dedicated to Hardy, Boston, and Fife for the year that they won the AIA Firm of the Year Award. And I was able to find out a few interesting facts about Mr. Hardy that I'd like to share with you. Number one, he was born in Spain, studied at Princeton under Ozarks Dean, um, John Labatut, and uh, interestingly enough, one of his first uh, jobs was as a set designer for Joe Mil Milziner, Milziner, a uh, famous uh, set designer in uh, New York City. Um, and in fact, um, I told you this afternoon that I have a very long-standing relationship with him, and it probably dates us both, but he was my freshman critic at Pratt in 1961, and I remember distinctly how proud he was to mention to all of us that at that time he was still a card-carrying member of the United Scenic Artists Local 829. I think he has since given up that membership, but obviously played a very important role. Still active. The article went on to mention that Hugh's work was influenced by the work of Milzy Nur and the late Errol Saarinen, who was collaborating at the, they were collaborating that time on the Vivian Beaumont Theater, which many of you know is one of several buildings making up the Lincoln Center complex. He has certainly established himself as a prominent individual architect, and in fact, I told him last Thursday evening, I turned on the History Channel to watch a wonderful one-hour documentary on the Chrysler Building, and who was there making commentary but Mr. Hugh Hardy. But this afternoon, I was most impressed with Hugh's comment about being interested in the big picture. And I commented at that time that I thought that his firm was so unique about being able to establish itself as both a cutting-edge firm and a firm dedicated to historic preservation. And I found a, a single quote in the 1981 AIA journal that I'll share with you. Quote, Mr. Hardy, our attitude was new is not better, new is different. Old is not worse, it's just not the same. For some weird reason, we didn't find old buildings shameful or embarrassing or necessarily something to be evangelical about either. I am honored to give you Mr. Hugh Hardy, FAIA. Thank you. Uh, it's been interesting to come here and think about how you guys live, how you all live here. It's not the way I live. And one of the joys of leaving the city is to see the world differently. We tend to be somewhat isolated in New York. You know all the jokes are true about um, how, how it is there. Uh, you, it, and it's very interesting to think about what would it be like to experience as you do, the places you live, the places you uh, work, and the places you play. I mean, those are the three things we all do. We live somewhere, and we work somewhere. Students certainly work, right? And we play. Now, the play could be some highly informed cultural activity, or play could be a game of baseball. Play is a complex cultural thing. In cities, it tends to be that one is surrounded by layers and layers of history. You can't avoid being aware of the past in any great city. And they're sort of time machines. You're constantly uh, 
thinking about and bumping into artifacts that other people were a part of, things that other generations made and, and gave you. Uh, and it's uh, part of the identity of the place. You really couldn't imagine New York without <clears throat> its tall buildings, without the, some of them by name. This is a, that uh, classic Feinegger view of 42nd Street. In a minute, you'll see it uh, as it's been changing. But uh, <clears throat> the importance of monuments to a city, monuments of, that mark a place, uh, uh, they're really essential to our sense of who we are. Uh, the streets are where we have uh, our social exchange and the access and transportation, and they're important too because that's where we come together as individuals. Uh, that's how you see each other. That's how you get the sense of what's happening in the city on a given day is in the streets themselves. And they are somehow the sum total. They lead to public space. Uh, and that's really, of course, the most important part of the city is not its buildings, but how, it bring, how they bring people together. So we think of restoration as just, and preservation, and I want to make a distinction between the two. Uh, as something that's intrinsically part of the city. I, as, coming here, I was wondering, would you restore a Dairy Queen in another generation? Would you restore a Walmart? Would you think it's important to find those values, those architectural statements, uh, somehow maintained in another generation? And it occurs to me, not really, why would you? Because, of course, those buildings are not conceived of to mark a place in time. They are really giant billboards. Venturi's correct. Uh, they, are, they are signage. And if they change tomorrow to different colors and different shapes and sold different products, you wouldn't be scandalized. Would, do you think another generation would go out and protest the transformation of a Dairy Queen into some other form of fast food? Do you think a furniture store made into a video shop would make any difference? And what is that consumer culture, disposable culture uh, like? Is that the future? Obviously, we don't think so here, because you are studying and working towards an understanding of restoration or preservation. And let's just take a minute to think about the difference between the two. Preservation assumes that there's something worth keeping. If you take it to its illogical extreme, Everything is worth keeping because everything is expression of some idea or some point in time, and everything is valuable. Well, that's absurd. Uh, on the other hand, if you take the extreme of restoration, that means you want to turn the clock back. And many people, if you take that to its logical extreme, believe that the oldest is the best. And so there are many projects that have, uh, under the guise of restoration, been made at totally false. They're made out of brand new materials, distressed to look old, because it's assumed that's the way something was originally, even though the fabric is all brand new. Well, that's absurd. So obviously what one is looking for in all of this is a balance between the way the world is, the way the world was, and the way the world is becoming. And what really makes this tricky is it's all involved with memory. It's all involved either at the large scale with cultural memory of place or personal memory of experience. And that's as powerful as any other aspect of either restoration or preservation. I happen to believe uh, <coughs> that true restoration is <laughs> impossible. I don't think it, I don't think it can be, uh, actually can't be achieved at all. Uh, the, the interesting thing about the, the new communities where people now live in this disposable culture are that they were created to get out of cities, to get out of the restrictions and the, uh, the, the confusion and the density of the way cities uh, were. And uh, they, uh, interestingly enough, have this cultural memory. Why is it that Disney would select Main Street as the introduction to its uh, theme parks. 
How could it be that, that this thing that Americans wanted to get out of could be such a powerful introduction to the experience of Disney World? It's astonishing how powerful main streets are, even for those who never lived on them or even knew them. That sense of community, that sense of people coming together is really quite extraordinary. The, the reason, however, I think you can't restore anything is I don't think it's possible to turn the clock back. I don't think you're the same as you were last week. You're certainly not the same as you were 10 years ago. And collectively, we are not the same now as we were even a year ago or so. And as a society, we don't behave the way we did in the 19th century. We don't wear the clothes that people wore in the 19th century. We don't sit the way people did in the 19th century. We don't know how to greet each other or how to use space or sit in a chair or open a door or do any of the things that people did in the 19th or 18th or 17th and the farther back. Uh, furthermore, we don't see the same way. We are used to lighting levels three times as bright as was the case even 30 years ago. Uh, it, it is amazing to see how, as the, the sources have become more efficient, how much we take for granted extraordinarily bright light levels. And when you raise the lighting level, you change everything in the space. We take air conditioning for granted. You wouldn't imagine a space that wasn't air conditioned, a car that wasn't air conditioned. Oh, soon every house in America will be air conditioned as well. It's astonishing how we take for granted creature comforts that uh, must be part of any restoration program, et cetera, et cetera. So even if you could, through some illusion, hide the air conditioning, uh, make the light levels what, as they were initially, solve all the technical problems, solve the code problems, because there are an enormous number of code problems with handicapped access, with uh, fire uh, retardant materials and so forth, solving all that, we can't recreate the people who were there in the early 20th century, the late 20th century, uh, any other point in time. We are ourselves, how could we possibly, the measurement of this restoration, if we ourselves are different, how possibly can we discover what the original was? Uh, and that's not bad or good, it just is. I mean, of course we're all changing. Uh, of course, that's part of the journey. It's part of the discovery, it's part of the fun, not being the same every single day. I believe you can't turn the clock back. I think Tom Wolfe was right, you can't go home again, and I don't see any reason why we should. So, the, the, what we can do, however, and what we are committed to doing, is to ensure that we don't lose our cultural memory, we don't lose the sense of who we are, and buildings, and the physical fabric of this society are very important to that. The public spaces, the uh, knowledge that they represent, the cumulative, it, it, it's absolutely crucial. Do you remember in 2001 when Hal loses his memory, the poignant thing of bit by bit as it's all being turned off and he's being destroyed and he's saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. It was such a powerful image of what would happen to this, <coughs> all conscious being, uh, who of course had become perverse, uh, the, the loss of memory would, would be a terrible thing. And we are here in the belief that this uh, commitment to preservation is an essential, is an essential thing. Uh, I thought it would be of value to show you just a few projects without getting into the subject of how you add on to buildings. That's a whole other topic called the relation of new to old. All of this is about the relation of new to old because there's no point in um, having something restored if it can't be used. And all of this stuff is really about who follows us. Uh, the reason we make these buildings is for others to use, others to be a part of, certainly in an institutional setting. And so I thought it might be interesting to take uh, some theaters, because they're all the same type of building, and uh, also a, a synagogue that um, has just been put back together, and uh, discuss it with you. Uh, now, if we uh, back up a second, one more, 
to the Feiniger. That's 42nd Street after the Feiniger picture. And you can see that it's in the, uh, this is the 20s. And you can tell from the ferry boat, the wide streets in Manhattan are the results of where the ferry boats landed, 42nd Street, 59th Street, and so forth. They were the big fat connections across the island to uh, the other boroughs and to New Jersey. And the next photograph shows you how clotted that landscape has become, how the individual buildings are all fusing together into one giant thing. That is the nature of what's happening in the city and how important individual landmarks are. Uh, it's great fun to look at pictures of midtown Manhattan and just take Photoshop and remove the Chrysler building. You could be anywhere on earth, but as soon as you see the Chrysler building, whammo, you know where you are. Next. Uh, this is 42nd Street, obviously on New Year's, and this, these are the kinds of public spaces, the collective places that make New York uh, itself. Ah, thank you. Uh, it, and it is unusual in a city so proud of its heritage, cultural heritage, that we have so few genuinely public spaces. That really is the streets in this mercantile space that uh, are, the, are the public spaces of Manhattan. And as a result, it was discovered by the Landmarks Commission, as we'll discuss later, that the street pattern of Lower Manhattan was the true landmark of the place. It, it had the recorded history of how commerce grew, how the uh, city changed as it became an, from uh, it, the nature of the port, how it became an important mercantile center. And the streets themselves are the glory of the place. Next. Uh, we use them for celebration. Next. Uh, we, we love our parades. This happens to have been the astronauts. Uh, it, it was uh, an extraordinary outpouring and celebration in the streets, in the public space of the city. Next. Uh, Central Park, of course, was created uh, as a, an oasis separate from the city, a completely different idea than bringing people together. It was, uh, and it was created when this fantastic skyline, of course, wasn't even imagined. It couldn't have been conceived that Central Park would be ringed and you would have this juxtaposition of a, a rural setting and this uh, man-made, as they say, stuff behind. Uh, but Central Park as a public space isn't what I'm speaking to when we uh, discuss this business of public-private partnerships next. Uh, it really is a, a place of recreation, a place to escape. Next. Uh, Lincoln Center, which was completely privately funded in part, but also uh, made possible by, the, uh, uh, by government. So in a sense, this too is a public-private partnership, as Central Park was. Uh, and in a sense, I suppose, the, the streets become. Uh, Lincoln Center never had its uh, genuine public uh, <coughs> design process completed because it really was thought of only as a way to get to these buildings. It has become increasingly more a place of community, and it's the community at the center core of this idea of public space that counts. Next. <clears throat> you can see here, you can stand around in the plaza, uh, but there ain't, that's sort of it. What, what has been discovered is the way to make this a community space is swing dancing. Oh, on a May evening, to see those bands and to see those people and to hear everybody sashaying around on that floor, I tell you, it is a joy. Well, that's, th that could be part of and programmed into and be what the architecture of a place like this was for. Uh, again, this sense of people coming together in public to make community. <coughs> Next. And then, of course, you know Rockefeller Center. What is interesting about it is how tiny it is and how successful it has become as a gathering place, as a, as a sense of community at the, in this case, the upper, the new center of the city. And the uh, relationship of the buildings to the space itself contains it in a way that makes it, without question, a landmark of landmarks. The city is now 
proposing a new plan that will fit together with the, uh, uh, the work of the state in the creation of parks and places in Lower Manhattan. And the city plan announces that there are three things of importance. The first is transportation, and we, uh, we don't have time to get into that in relation to each of these projects, but when you speak of urban uh, situation, the uh, transportation, the access that is beyond the streets themselves, it's all the integration of activities that transportation represents, is crucial. And in Lower Manhattan, transportation becomes the basis for building, as you will see. Second thing is the creation of community, meaning housing. And the third is public space. And this is a uh, rendering proposing on Fulton Street, a Fulton Market, uh, which would be a new gathering place for the community. So it's been interesting that this generation in New York is trying to reestablish the values that make a community come together at its core. And the projects I'm going to show you, each in turn, have contributed to that process, however small, in some cases, however great. And that is, of course, the larger dimension of what restoration, preservation, call it what you will, can contribute. This idea of people coming together across generations, across time, in a sense of community. What, what makes families so powerful? It's all those associations, good and bad. What makes family gatherings so remarkable, good and bad? All the, the, the tensions and the joys of getting one's family together, that's what happens in community at the larger scale. So. Let's look at <clears throat> old stuff. And here comes some old stuff. The first is the new Victory Theater. This was the corner on the right is where the Times Building is now. That sign saying Lyceum Theater is the corner of 42nd Street and Broadway. And behind, you see a, a residential neighborhood covered with billboards on top of brownstones. And that was uh, just about 1897, this was the way that intersection looked. Next. Then, Oscar Hammerstein. Oscar Hammerstein I, the grandfather of Oscar Hammerstein II, who worked with Richard Rogers, built theaters all over the city. He lost them all the time. He was a great entrepreneur and was able, he, was, he, he started out in cigars. And obviously the guys who smoked cigars were the kind of people he wanted to get to know. And uh, he got to know the wealthy and the famous, borrowed money from them left and right, and built all kinds of theaters and lost them, each one in turn. This was the Hammerstein's Victoria, which had a roof garden on it. And off to the left there, just behind it, you can see the Victory Theater, as it's now called, only then it was called <coughs> the Lyceum. And uh, I, I, I don't have a pointer, but up there <laughs> where it is, is the victory. Next. It was then taken over by David Belasco, who uh, fancied it up, next, and decided that he needed a bigger stage. And he transformed the interior. He changed all of the uh, decorative plaster work uh, and was able to book Houdini in an act uh, where he made an elephant disappear, legend says. Now, we don't really know if he made an elephant disappear, but uh, he, he constructed a stage of uncommon depth that went down three stories with all kinds of machinery, and maybe he did make an elephant disappear. But the point is that this building, only five years after it was built, was totally transformed in its decorative scheme. Next. Uh, it then became a burlesque house, for uh, Minsky, and Minsky's burlesque had a very famous show because it had double runways. It was the only theater in America with double runways, and so you got a lot for your money as the girls paraded around. Uh, Minsky's went bust, and it became a movie strip, as you see here, and the movies declined to the point where the theater began to show porno, and then the whole thing died. Uh, it was, next, a pretty sorry relic. And 
I, it, it would be fun to, to talk with you about, again, public-private partnership and community because it, this project was made possible by the state of New York that condemned these properties and put them back into public circulation. But it's the public who pays for all this because the, it's, this is a commercial venture where the public has to pay the price of admission. Ah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. The, um, uh, also, the public is paying here through private foundations because the theater has become subsidized as a theater for young audiences and therefore kids come for the first time from all over the city into this amazing place and see their first show. So, uh, the facade, as you see, had here some decorative work. It had on top lost the uh, great urns that used to be here. Uh, it had gained this uh, marquee, and the double staircase had been removed when uh, it was made into a burlesque house. The facade had been painted over many times with all kinds of signage and stuff, and it was hard to, s I mean, you just didn't know that this was a serious building. But this little theater, which now seats 900, originally 1,000, was absolutely the key to the restoration of 42nd Street. Now, whether 42nd Street has become Disneyfied and therefore bad, because Disney is always used pejoratively, uh, or whether it is a new venue f f uh, in the city f for performance is not yet known because the street is still being put back together. There are, being in New York, there are conflicting opinions about whether this is a good or bad. But it's taken place because the Victory Theater made the commitment to be an institution that would be nonprofit, not uh, pass or fail, depending upon box office results. And it would therefore lead to Disney taking over the New Amsterdam, and that was the catalyst that made 42nd Street uh, what it is today. Next, here is the facade restored. Good heavens! And you see the graphics up here are in place of the original pots that we had flaming oil poured in them at showtime so that the top of the theater would be in flame. And the signage, which is mandated on 42nd Street uh, around the theater, and the uh, staircase itself. Now, the street had been widened, and so it, we couldn't make the staircase its original dimension. It's actually three feet less coming out than it used to. Like, imagine a bureau drawer, you just push it back three feet, but it looks the same in every other way. And it would not have been possible to put this staircase back if it hadn't been an act of restoration. It took five city agencies to get this thing approved, and they all were in support of it because it was a restoration. If I had proposed a modernist glass staircase, such as in, in the Apple <coughs> computer store in Soho, which is absolutely fantastic achievement in glass, uh, a, a, a great, a, 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 an extraordinary modernist creation here, gleamings. I mean, imagine something so fantastical, it makes you weep, forget it. It's only possible to have done this <laughs> because it was a restoration. And of course, this is a reconstruction of, as imagined from photographs. It's not the original profiles that I can swear to. It's not the original stonework. <laughs> it's only a simulacrum of what was there. But we did get back, there are two little children here, we, got the we put the head back on the eagle, we put the uh, uh, fingers back and the toes back, but we did not, which you can't tell in this photograph, but this cornice line, had all of brownstone, had been seriously eroded over time, and much of the stonework here, which is the original, also had the wonderful contours of, and weathering of time, and their original. The same is true of uh, the brownstone trim in these openings. We deliberately left them, so, and the, uh, some of the attachments for signage in the past are still very much in evidence, so that you get a sense of the history of this building. We didn't want it to look brand new. That would be absurd. <coughs> On the inside, the auditorium had suffered uh, severely. Air conditioning had been put in by closing off the boxes. It didn't work very well. Uh, every time I look at this photograph, I think of the horrible aroma of this place. 
and uh, the, it is amazing to see it transformed as it now is uh, with the people back in the boxes, technology in the form of speaker clusters and house lighting, and all of the appropriate uh, contemporary hardware of theater. What's remarkable about this room is it's a little European opera house, and it, it, it has an intimacy, as you'll see in the next photograph, where the, uh, the walls and the seats can, are configured around uh, so that you, you are embraced as you stand at the center stage. Uh, there's an inalienable rule about theaters. If you stand at center stage and the room goes away from you, it's a terrible place. Try it. Let's try any usual high school auditorium. You feel the, all the energy being taken out of you. But if you stand at the center of a really great theater, you feel it come towards you, and you feel the people joining you. And that's what happens in the Victory Theater. Also, <clears throat> Belasco <coughs> transformed the plaster work, and he made three-dimensional draperies here. This is in part painting, but it's also three-dimensional. And he took the liars away from these puto. These puti had of when he did his work, he, for whatever reason, didn't like them, so he took them away. Uh, and all of the rest of this plaster work is Belasco's. So when the restoration time came, it seemed to me appropriate to put back the color scheme of Belasco, which as you see is very rich, very heavy. He, he was very theatrical with a capital T. But I couldn't resist putting back the liars, even though they weren't there when Belasco was there, because this composition only made sense to me with the liars in place. Now, that is not purist restoration. That is an interpretation that puts the whole thing together. Uh, I can't promise that everything about the drapery is original either, but we tried very hard. And we made a seating fabric which has woven into it uh, uh, laurel wreaths and bees for Belasco because in the decorative plaster work here there were bees, insects, uh, in the uh, plaster work for Belasco. So we thought, why not? And you'll find when you go there, bees all around in the room for Belasco. Uh, the carpet here is an interpretation of a Victorian pattern which is by computer blown up in the lobby. It's the same pattern but it's just four times larger in scale and the same kinds of colors. So it, this is an interpretation of the past. Next. And you can see here, oh, and the upper balcony, we had to reduce the number of seats and change the slope because uh, you have to imagine this being used for young people. Their feet would be in the ears of the row in front of them uh, if we didn't change the configuration because people are bigger than they used to be. On an average American, bottoms are two inches wider than they once were. <laughs> Next. And this is before, this, this was taken just as the theater was completed and you, uh, you would be amazed now to see what's happened to that single block as a result of uh, the victory's appearance. Now, the next one is the New Amsterdam and a completely different set of uh, concerns. It was built in 1904, and that little skinny piece of cake is the entrance into the auditorium, which is down on 41st Street. This is 42nd Street uh, as it became, as after the New Amsterdam was in its prime. The New Amsterdam was built uh, to be the most expensive theater in the city. And it uh, opened with a Shakespearean production of Midsummer Night's Dream. And it was designed to be a sort of super duper uh, spectacle. And it was a total failure. The uh, theater didn't do very well. Nobody knew what would come of it. And somebody had the idea, because there was two theaters in one, there's a rooftop theater, that they might rent out the rooftop to this guy who did a review. And nobody knew anything about him, but you know, why not? We've got, got to use the place somehow. And he was Florence Ziegfeld. And he had a little review uh, which grew to be a very big review which saved the theater and transformed it. And for years it was the Ziegfeld Follies that made the New Amsterdam a success. 
Uh, it resonates all throughout theater literature. That whole business of the showgirl was a Ziegfeld creation. Hollywood is fooled with it. Broadway musicals still fool with that tradition of the showgirl and the showgirl parade and all this stuff. They had a great staircase. They would come down the great staircase and then go into the basement and rush back up a second elevator and come down the great staircase again, parading, uh, parading, parading. Uh, it, it was uh, an amazing phenomenon. The theater also had reverted to the movies and uh, had slid down and was finally closed and stood abandoned for eight years as water poured through the roof and there were mushrooms growing in the orchestra floor when uh, we were first there. This is an interesting photograph because it shows you the layering in time that the New Amsterdam uh, survived. Uh, it was built without a marquee. And buried underneath all that is a, the first marquee, but it's not the original marquee. And the signage that uh, increasingly appeared as these buildings had to compete with the movie palaces of Times Square, remember this is 42nd Street, not Times Square, got to be uh, more and more ambitious. So uh, the state, when it was announced we were going to restore this building, said to us, well, you must put back the original marquee. And I had the fun of saying to the state, which one? Because there were so many, and what was the point? Because in fact, the uh, original marquee was the movie house marquee already in place, which you'll see. The public spaces, uh, yes, you can see there, before its restoration, the uh, movie house marquee, and saying the New Amsterdam with the clock and all the rest, and a really snazzy terrazzo entrance floor. All of that's original. Why would you demolish it in favor of a reconstruction of something that would have to be an imagined interpretation of an original marquee? And how would you decide which original marquee was the most original? Uh, <coughs> the public spaces, you'll see, were in bad repair. This was the men's smoking room. Now, what do you mean the men's smoking room? Where were the women? Well, there were no facilities for the women. The guys went down and had their cigars and talked over business and did stuff and do what guys do. And the women were up there fanning themselves, reading the program. Why? Well, if you look at the program, you'll see that all the ads were for fur coats and stuff that women would buy because it was known that they would be sitting in their seats during the intermission, and this was a good way to appeal to an audience. But why? Why were the women sitting in their seats when this theater was designed? Now, this was designed at the turn of the century, and it seems inconceivable, what I'm about to say, but to re truly restore this building, you would have to restore a society in which the men only use this room, and the women sat in their seats up there, fanning themselves and reading about fur coats. The reason was that it was not polite for women to go to public facilities in public at the turn of the century. And the reason they were trained as little girls never ever to do it was they couldn't get out of their clothes without assistance. They were so trussed up as examples of their husband's success, particularly in places like the fancy New Amsterdam. They were showpieces for the social advantage of their husband and they needed assistance to get out of all the layers of stuff that they had to wear in public, and so therefore they couldn't. I mean, it was really a distress if you had to use facilities in public. And it, little girls were, from an early age, trained never to go and use public facilities. So how could you possibly imagine that for restoration? So this part is easy. It's easy to put back the murals, although actually it isn't. Uh, and that's perhaps another story, uh, because there were some missing and some by conjecture and some relegated from postcards uh, uh, and some imagined. But um, as a whole, it works well. And this is now, of course, a public place for everyone to use. In the auditorium, th uh, all kinds of ravages had occurred in order to make a wider motion picture screen in here, the boxes had been cut off. The wood paneling that rose up here, for, for reasons I do not know, uh, was taken away, although I guess I do know. It was part of removing the boxes here. 
the floor had been changed, the uh, ceiling, uh, one quadrant of the plaster ceiling had fallen up here, actually. And the, you can see after eight years with the roof leaking, this was not a successful place. Uh, it was Michael Eisner who saw in the building the uh, possibility of its restoration. And uh, he, made, he made a very tough bargain with the state that indeed Disney would come into the project if they rented up the rest of the block, if they got agreements to ensure that Disney wouldn't be left holding the bag for uh, all the rest of the development. And so Disney was not only a, a cheerleader for the project, but they, uh, and their visibility made others want to join, uh, they became the, the catalyst for all of the 42nd Street development, which included hotels, and now, of course, the, uh, the new home of the New York Times. Next. Uh, it was important to study, and we could use the computer for this, the sight lines and the acoustics of the hall, because Disney wanted to add two more rows in the back of the auditorium in order to get the capacity up to what was their threshold of pain about the economics of this theater. An individual theater seat, of course, produces hundreds of thousands of dollars a year if you have a hit like The Lion King. No one knew The Lion King would be as successful as it is, but uh, they naturally assumed that they were going to have uh, something that would fill the house. And uh, th these computer studies were helpful both from the point of view of locating seating and acoustics, because how you see and how you hear intimately align. Next. And this was an investigation from the upper balconies. You can see uh, this is all very crude to the purpose of sight lines, but more than helpful as we moved into the restoration <laughs> itself. Next. Uh, here you see the boxes put back in place, the paneling restored, all of the, the plaster work recreated. Uh, these boxes are interpretations of the motifs found on the balcony faces. They were actually made in Canada and trundled down. It, it was cheaper to have the plaster done in Canada than have them uh, cast locally. And I, I just think it's amazing that you could take these same motifs and with uh, sculptural analysis, you could actually develop all of these forms which were created in sections about this big and put together, not unlike the original. The key to all this was the mural. The color scheme of the great mural and what it said, which was the history of entertainment, uh, was the definition of the color scheme for the room. That and the paint analysis of everything that's in here. And of course, it was wonderful that this would be a Disney show, this place that itself is like an enchanted forest. Even before we knew uh, what the Lion King was going to be, it seemed promising. And then, of course, when the Lion King itself appeared, and the uh, performers at the beginning of the production come down the aisles and include the auditorium as part of the stage with musicians in these boxes. It was quite spectacular. But at the center here, you, it's hard to see in this projection, as right there is the figure of truth, and there is tradition, and there is poetry, and a whole bunch of allegorical figures. And when you could go up on the scaffolding which is, and we were, you know, close to the mural itself, trying to get the basic color schemes correct because that would determine everything else in the room. Uh, it, it turned out that they had made truth into a babe. They had given her a much more impressive bosom. They had slimmed down her hips and she had turned at some point into this naked woman. And I remember a reporter for the, uh, Daily News coming and saying, oh, oh, look at that, look at that, naked woman, Disney, naughty, 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 nasty. And I looked at her straight in the eye and said, no, 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 that's truth. So <laughs> she was shamed into not writing a story about naked women in a Disney show. Uh, the, anyway, the mural is the crucial part of this restoration. All the seating fabrics reproduced. All of the color of the paneling, which had been glazed green, was a very popular thing in Art Nouveau. This theater is supposed to be Art Nouveau. Maybe it is. It's, it, if it is, it's the, the, the loosest Art Nouveau definition ever achieved. All of this plaster work, as you saw, is, is brand new. 
Uh, and all, all, actually, this mural is new, and the one on the opposite side is a restoration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Next. Uh, it, it's fun to see how l luxurious this is, but it is, the room is designed in such a way that when the house lights disappear, all this stuff goes away, and the stage is what comes to life, which is, after all, the reason you came. And the reason for that is the geometry of the room itself. It was designed by Hertz and Talent, who were the finest New York uh, architects for theater. They did the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and they also did uh, five other uh, theaters. The oldest theater in New York that's still functioning is the Lyceum, which they designed. Next. And here again, all of this work is brand new. All uh, cast in Canada and sculpted from photographs and uh, through paint analysis and adjustment. Now, when I spoke earlier of lighting levels, uh, we worked very carefully to make sure that although I was told what the original colors were, but they were, they were subdued from the original original because the lighting levels are much higher. And as Disney has used the hall, they have put pattern projectors in, which are really quite marvelous because there's a kind of indistinct quality of light in the place, much closer to the way it was in, <coughs> initially illuminated with these carbon filament bulbs. Next. There's the ceiling with the four quadrants, and you're about to see a peacock up close. There's a peacock up close. That, now, you are selecting these colors and determining these glazing methods when you're, you know, 18 inches away, and they're going to be seen 60 feet away in uh, a different form of lighting. So it is really tricky stuff. And here comes my favorite. Here comes Dawn. This fixture was found in an upper attic room, put away clearly by somebody who wanted her saved and wanted her rediscovered. There she is, and there are 24 of these fixtures in the theater, which have now been recast, and she's Aurora, waking up, you see, the sunburst flowers in her hair. And uh, they, she, I can't imagine any contemporary sculptor being able to produce a face quite like that. Uh, we could get close, but never quite like that. So we were very fortunate. Next. There's the, oh, this is about the embrace of the room itself. Next. Uh, and then finally here is the marquee, the original, original marquee, but not <laughs> original, original. Next. Now, I'll go on all night about this, but um, I'll try and be brief. Because for me, this is one of the most amazing places ever made. Uh, and unlike those two examples I've shown you where the effort was to restore something but give it a sense of its <laughs> own past, not to make it look brand new, not, because they were not buildings conceived of in that tradition. They were conceived of as part of a continuity of theatrical expression. They, even when they were new, they were deliberately linked to tradi traditional styles of things. Even the New Amsterdam Theater, when it was new and it was, the, the, nobody had ever seen anything like it in the city before this Art Nouveau stuff. It was still linked to a tradition of decorative theater painting that was ancient, in fact. And so we didn't want these buildings, uh, well, there's one more factor in the New Amsterdam. A lot of it's made of wood. And in order to restore the wood to the color it had been originally, you'd have to bleach it. And you'd have to do all kinds of damage to the original scheme uh, to make it look as it was opening day. Well, that isn't the purpose in a theater such as that. However, Radio City Music Hall was conceived to be brand new. It was imagined in the spirit of newness, so that to restore this, you had to, from my point of view. How's this for being inconsistent? You had to give it that sense of newness that was intrinsically part of the basic building. This thing opened in 1932 in the depths of the Depression, and it, uh, as you well know, was a failure that went on until one in the morning and people left in droves and they uh, floundered around to find some way to make the thing survive. Roxy, whose idea it was to have sort of high-class vaudeville, went out of the place on a stretcher, never went back, died two weeks later, and uh, was told that he was finished with the Rockefellers. And they decided on this new policy of movies in a stage show, which, of course, was the formula that kept it going until it was almost demolished. Uh, but anyway, 
the, this place had in it a, a, a quality of uh, newness that seemed to me essential to bring back and to be and to have it as polished and gleaming as possible. Next. And so all of the mythology of the place that this was the, the show place of America, et cetera, had to be brought back and it was tough. Next. <clears throat> this is what the great foyer was once upon a time. Uh, and it's a remarkable sequence of spaces because you come into the box office area, which is very low ceiling <coughs> with indirect gold domes, and then you're brought into this great towering space, uh, 80, it's 75 feet tall, and you see on the right the openings of the various balconies and mezzanines that overlook the great stage. And it is certainly one of the most vertical rooms ever. And then you pass under the balconies and into the auditorium in that giant sunburst. Wow, what a sequence of uh, spatial experience. Well, next, it had become really grungy. Uh, this, all these spaces, in order to save money and maintenance, had been painted brown. The walls, ditto, 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 had been covered in brown. The uh, carpet, because it cost less, had been reprinted uh, instead of rewoven, and they cut down the number of repeats so that it was not the original pattern at all. The only thing in here that was original were the railings and the marble from Portugal on the walls and, uh, of course, the doorways and the mirrors. The mirrors are interesting because they're silvered in gold. There's only one place left in America that knows how to silver things in gold. And it was thought that maybe we could have these replaced because along the edges there, there's a little bit of imperfection. But they, nobody knew how to make them at this size. And so those are indeed the original mirrors. Transformed by restoration, it is now possible to see all of these faces in gold. And interestingly enough, it is, and the ceiling here, is not gold leaf. It's aluminum leaf which has been glazed with three layers of yellow shellac and it appears to be gold. And the same thing is true on these faces as well. And the original carpet, the walls brought back to their marvelous terracotta color, the draperies here rewoven and hung anew. And here, the most difficult insertion of all, new lighting positions to raise the lighting levels in here because in the past, as the maintenance had made the place darker and darker, they'd made the wattage and the existing fixtures brighter and brighter, so all you got was glare. You didn't get the aura, the romance, the glowing nature of this room. Almost all the sources of light, except for these chandeliers and these sconces, all of the sources are indirect so that the room glows. And these enabled us to provide spotlit locations so that displays which they, uh, commercial interests sometimes use the, the rent this space as a public space, it was possible to raise the lighting levels without causing glare. Next. And then you see here, looking this marvelous terracotta and gold with the brass, uh, silver and uh, gold are very much in these handrails and a part of these doors, which are stainless steel and brass, as they <coughs> extend down into the lower lounge, and it is an essay in silver and black. Next. And there it goes. Here comes the great stair down with its own murals. Now, these lighting fixtures are the original, but they're inserted in them a second component which produces a downlight because we're so used to spaces that have that kind of sparkle that uh, we, you would be very disappointed to come here if it didn't have all the enjoyment and excitement that you associate with the place. And then off to the side here, you see, uh, is the men's lounge. Next, which we'll come to. First, you're going to see the women's lounge. Uh, imagine that you're able to adjust your hat and your makeup and socialize a little in these rooms. Next, here is the men's lounge with the Stuart Davis mural, which we borrowed back from the Museum of Modern Art since they have this major reconstruction program. They were delighted to lend it. And it's called Men Without Women uh, and fits the room just marvelously. This is all original Donald Desky furniture. 
And the ceiling, this had been used as a storage room for popcorn. We were able to reclaim it and recover the ceiling in copper leaf in this case and reinstall these lighting fixtures and uh, have a good time. Next. These are, there, there are a whole set of public rooms which were designed by American artists. It was uh, George O'Keefe among others, although uh, she finally pulled out because uh, Weston told her that she wasn't being paid enough and that these were second-rate artists that she was working uh, around and she shouldn't be seen with them. But uh, there were many uh, fabulous fabrics designed. This was recreated from a newspaper article and a, an accounting of the color scheme. And you'll see here next a uh, mural, this panther, and these wonderful uh, uh, benches, which are part of the makeup section in the, one of the ladies' lounges. There are a whole set of these places, each different. Uh, remarkable, remarkable. Next. In the main hall, uh, the stage, of course, does all kinds of tricks. There's the, the uh, fact that it was studied for the, the hydraulics and the elevator systems here were studied when they were making the first aircraft carriers and they needed to figure out how to have uh, elevators that would be reliable that would lift airplanes up and down uh, on the aircraft carriers. And they did indeed study the machinery here. Uh, and the great contour curtain and all the rest, you, you know all the legends. But can you imagine taking this whole place apart and having to put it all back together again, especially if you're as affectionate about it as I? Next. Uh, now, it, it's known as a place of great spectacle. Yes, 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 yes. Crazy things happened here. This was a, con a convention dinner and presentation. Next. And it, they did a wonderful job of ensuring that personalities when they came to town would always be seen in the headlines of Radio City. If Lucy and Des came, they'd have a little press conference with the Rockettes, et cetera. If an ambassador came, they'd have a little press conference with the uh, Rockettes. If anybody came to town of any importance, they'd have a little uh, press conference with the Rockettes. But as the formula uh, began to not work, as there were no general uh, entertainment movies, as families didn't go to the movies together because there wasn't any product that would bring them. And uh, as the expenses got higher and higher, it finally was the case that Radio City was closed and was going to be demolished. Next. Uh, and it looked like this. Uh, the sides had these strange curtains added on top of a whole bunch of pipe supports that were put in place to uh, house lighting equipment. There were wires and uh, junk all over the place. All of these faces had become brown. Brown would become the order of the day there. The carpet had the original pattern. Again, it was printed. And it uh, had turned green in the course of time, whereas it was originally beige and pink and blue. And it was said that these, the pattern was called fish. In point of fact, because it was, looked like fish swimming around in a green murk, in point of fact, it was designed by Desky, and it was called a pattern called Singing Maiden. And there were not waves, but there were the stylized waves of her hair, and there was a face, and she was singing. And when you saw the original colors, you understood it. The seats were beat up. I could go on. How difficult to take a hall that seats almost 6,000 people and transform it. Next. But we did. And it is a joy to see now because the faces are against gold, the, the curtains are the original. The whole place has been repainted in a, uh, it originally it was stippled by hand uh, so that they were in three different colors. We were now able to use a new technology and spray it and get the same colors, including little flecks of gold, which uh, allow these cove lights to have wonderful reflective surfaces. Each one of these, uh, lights up in four colors. And so you can change each cove from red, blue, green, and amber. Uh, and the coves can then make waves of light wash through the room. It's the damnedest thing you've ever seen. A great blue wave washes through the room, or a red wave, or you can have any color you choose. And then in addition, the sunburst rays here are lit from behind. And then, of course, there's the contour curtain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. But the, the, the taking of this building and bringing it back to life as a part of Rockefeller Center 
has been a major uh, enhancement of this part of town. Next. There you go. Okay, one more. There you go. Oh, yes, I'm so pleased because we got to put the gold back. It had turned red. It was amazing, just little things. Of course it should be gold. Next. This is the way it looks. And uh, I can see this photograph and think of the smell. It had been 10 years with water seeping into it. It's like a Jacques Cousteau movie. You know, you go <laughs> down in between the weeds and the eels, and you can sort of hear a flute in the background. But the stench was extraordinary. And this theater was built when Brooklyn was its own city, before it became part of Manhattan. Before, uh, <clears throat> the, actually, yes, the Manhattan Bridge was under construction. And it was a tryout theater for Broadway shows. Gershwin shows tried out <coughs> here before they made it into Broadway. And it was a really fine theater designed by, strangely enough, the architect of the new Victory Theater, McFaltrick. Uh, and it had down here an orchestra, here the first balcony, and there the first balcony, and then above uh, a coffered ceiling. Next. And this is the original section. There's the first balcony. I'm sorry, first balcony, second balcony, orchestra floor, stage, before. Next. What we did, however, to restore this room was to transform it. These faces were taken off, and this, the first balcony, was continued down to here, and the stage floor was raised one level, and everybody comes together, and the focus of the room is in front of the proscenium instead of being behind the proscenium. What a transformation. Next. So that here you see the front of the balcony was cut off, this first balcony was brought down this way, the stage was raised, and underneath was turned into public space. And then these two levels of boxes, this is the third one down here, disappeared, were uh, set on the stage floor. Next. This is the process of construction. We couldn't change these. These are uh, curving steel channels. We couldn't change the basic structure of the room, we'd have to demolish the theater, uh, but we could extend this forward. And if you go there, you'll find this piece of steel still in the orchestra. It's a great delight to me. We had to cut a piece to bring the aisles through, but you can actually sense where the first balcony was when you sit in the room. And then you see the faces have disappeared, and you can sense where the stage floor is going to come next. And there it is, complete. Now, this is a functioning theater. It's unusual because it has bench seating, which Peter wanted. It's unusual for him because it has upholstery, which he didn't. Uh, he wanted Europeans to suffer for their art, and apparently they do without complaining, but New Yorkers complained bitterly, and so we got upholstery. But you see, the focus of the room is here, and there's this really remarkable space, although sometimes I've, there are productions with seating in here, and it's used in a conventional way, even with a, an orchestra pit and the stage curtains. But what's truly remarkable about this is the character of the room, because we left everything that was original and added nothing except contemporary lighting equipment and new seating and configuration. Next. You can see how the building was built. You can see what's there. You can see everything as they say, it all hangs out, and it's part of the character of the room. And there's, this is, without question, restoration, but not in the conventional sense. Next. Whoops, oh, just one, back up one second. Uh, but w what's truly remarkable here, speaking of time and memory and all that, is to see a Chekhov play. There's currently a production of Uncle Vanya, and uh, seeing the cherry orchard here did me in, because there is a play all about changes, all about the, the old world disappearing and the new world uh, coming apace, and the, uh, or, the order of society being transformed. Nothing about, all about time, all about what happens in time. And you're sitting in a room just redolent of what happens in time, just layer and layer and layer upon time. You can actually, if you know it well enough, see the color when it became a movie theater. You can see the original colors and so forth. So to see this 
in, have this environment be the context in which you see a play that is about time is quite remarkable. Okay, last one. Uh, Central Synagogue was built at 55th and Lex when it, this was a residential neighborhood. And Mr. Fernbach was impressed by a building that he saw in Budapest. He didn't copy it, but he sure as hell liked it a lot. And uh, it, he cozied up to it in many ways. And he invented <laughs> for Americans the idea that the Jewish faith could be presented with uh, Moorish architecture. There are all kinds of ironies <coughs> in this, of course. Uh, and th it is interesting that he succeeded so and had cut such a swath through the architecture of his time. When this was a little residential neighborhood, this was a very powerful building. Next. And it still is a powerful building, even in contemporary uh, Manhattan. We have restored uh, all kinds of things on the exterior in terms of detail, put back the roof and on and on and on, and I could go, in, and the lighting fixtures, and I could go about that in great detail, uh, but perhaps another day. What counts here, however, is the, the interior, next, and how does one put back something that's been completely destroyed and talk about memory because people had graduated here, people had had every <laughs> mar been married here, funerals here, bar mitzvahs, bas mitzvahs, you name it, everything under the sun next happening in this place. Uh, and over time, of course, it had been changed in many, many ways. All kinds of ideas about how to use light bulbs, all kinds of ideas about what the decorative arts can offer. Uh, the the uh, commandments are here. Uh, on and on and on and on and on. What do you do when a place like this sav uh, suffers the ravages of fire? Next. And the roof was lost. This was the organ loft. Uh, everything in here was subject to, uh, uh, being, uh, to demolition. These are cast iron columns which survived. This wood fascia survived. This bracketed wood fascia survived, and this table, amazingly enough, when cleaned off, survived. And that was it. All the plaster here had to be taken down because we were afraid with the amount of water that it had taken in that it would be unstable. Next. The organ clearly had to disappear. All of this plaster work, all of this plaster work, all of this ornament, only the, the basic structural itself survived. And the roof was replaced with the original members uh, in wood, because it turns out, you know, that wood survives better than steel and a fire. And to use concrete and steel seemed to be wrong from the point of view of the memories of the congregation. And so we built it like a ship. Next. And you can see here how the metal roof, which was the culprit because there was somebody up using a blowtorch who wasn't supposed to be using a blowtorch. Over the weekend, the fire smoldered and thought that they had been put out, but it smoldered all weekend long and then burst at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning. The whole roof took off. Uh, this little portion had its separate roof, and that is over the ark. So amazingly enough, the ark survived, and the scrolls had been taken out earlier because of the work being done on the interior. So the, the most sacred and the most important part of the whole building was in one piece. Next. But how do you, what do you do? And this gives you some sense about how much was removed. But in, I think, yes, you can see uh, that this is a scaffolding hung from the trusses above, and we worked two crews. One worked above and one worked below because we were also excavating a new community space in the uh, space below. But every surface in here, it's hard to believe now, every single surface in here is brand new. Next. So uh, what was important was to replace, and alas, these photographs want to give you some indication of it, the original color scheme and the elaborateness of the Moorish architecture and all that, which of course comes from tents, comes from people making enclosures that are, that are you know, nomadic enclosures that you could raise up in the desert. And it seemed important to us that the stenciling, this is all hand stenciling. I've forgotten how many different stencils we cut for the project. I should remember that. 
uh, <clears throat> I didn't want, you get some sense of it here, I didn't want it to look like wallpaper or to be uniform. And so we used sand plaster as a finish. And then we deliberately made the craftsmen, and they were uncomfortable about it at first, uh, make this stuff slightly un uniform, slightly different from one part to another, to deliberately give it the quality of being handmade. <clears throat> and that's true throughout the place. These are the original colors, adjusted uh, in some cases because of the lighting, but by and large, uh, I think you'll see in the next slide. Next. Uh, no, well, it's all right. Uh, as you march towards the altar, the ark, which um, has this wonderful original woodwork and had darkened with time and had the gold had been slightly abraded by all the <laughs> ravages it had been through. That we kept in its original condition, or original meaning post-fire. Uh, and we let the gold at the east end, all of this uh, highlighted stuff, and there's all kinds of wonderful little details be as brilliant as it wanted to. And as you move towards the west end where the ark is, it's subdued until finally the ark is uh, what controls. I think you can see in the next photograph, maybe? Well, no, it's the gonna be the last one. This, these are just fun because they give you some sense of the richness of the solutions. Next, that's my, uh, if you like color. Um, I was saying earlier, when I went to school, there was no color in architecture because we were not taught that architecture could have any color. How about that? Next, here we go. You see, this had to control, like the mural in the New Amsterdam had to set this, the, the whole tonality for the room. The ark itself had to be the most impressive thing in the room. And so as these, all these gold details march towards the um, ark, they, they become sub more subdued. And this was, although the top had to be completely rebuilt, uh, this is the original. And the floor, uh, there is still a place in England that makes these encaustic tiles, and 40% uh, of them are original and all the rest are new, and they are all mixed up in a way that you can't tell. It pleases me no end, because it seems to all fit together. We, we also changed how you enter the room, uh, because we changed levels uh, in order to take the staircase out on Madison Avenue, make it less steep, we pushed down the entranceway and allowed you then to walk up into the sanctuary. You can see here the handrails that uh, permit that to happen. It's a much more dramatic progression up into the room. If you were a purist, however, you would say I was a vandal. And uh, you'll, I invite you to go look, see what you think. Next. Now, I couldn't resist. <laughs> even though this is taking a long time, isn't it? You want to go? <laughs> you can leave if you want to. I swear I'll be done in 10 minutes. Um, five minutes, how's that? Uh, you, you can't just talk about these old buildings without thinking about the new, because new and old are, are so inevitably related. Uh, and we have an opportunity in New York to do something new, and it's about something very old called Lower Manhattan. We, we've, we've got this hole, which is seven stories deep. We've got 17 acres of nothing. And have we got memories? And if, isn't that what restoration and isn't that what all of this is about? And it seems to me it is. And I encourage you to think about this as you watch us struggle with <coughs> what to do. Uh, w one of the uh, difficulties we have is that there's nobody in charge, and I won't get into the politics of it, uh, but uh, you will no doubt see that we're having a, both a political problem and a design problem, uh, and I think it'll take probably five or ten years to get this all unraveled. But clearly at the center of it all is this business about a memorial, and what is a memorial if it isn't about memory? And uh, who is a memorial for? It certainly isn't for the dead, it's for the living. And it isn't even for us, because we all know, we all have memories that will stay with us as long as we can think or feel. But another generation, they'll just hear about it. And it's important for another generation. It's important for us to give knowledge uh, and to provide an experience of the values 
that we think are both sustained and destroyed by what happened there. So it's complicated. Uh, Herbert Mouchamp tried to solve the problem by having a whole bunch of stars do little things like a pastry tray. There were these wonderful little canapes out in a pastry tray. <coughs> and, but it was interesting what he said he was doing, and I quote, the product envisioned by the study is a recast cultural identity for 21st century New York, a new set, a, a new, a, a revised mythology of our place in the era of globalization. Gosh, <laughs> it sounds very impressive. Uh, but how does architecture do that? How can, uh, how can one take forms, architectural forms, and imbue them with uh, such concepts? Well, um, there's this, again, th the whole subject of the place itself. There never was a site in which context was more important, which is ironic, because there's Herbert trying to say context is unimportant. That's his new thing. Context doesn't count. We all believe it does. He wouldn't be here worrying about preservation. Uh, and it therefore involves you with memory. There's the memory of the towers themselves. There are the memory of the streets. Now, as I said before, the streets have become in Lower Manhattan a landmark. And there's been great pressure to say that what makes New York, New York is streets. The public life of the city is in the streets. We give us our streets back. Uh, there is the memory of all of the extraordinary, the shopping mall, all of that experience of, of being able to be in the consumer culture. Uh, there's the memory of all the easy access that it provided for uh, transit. On the other hand, the super block that that thing represented meant that it was isolated from the rest of the city, that it didn't have access to the west, it didn't have access to the north, it was cut off. Uh, that it, the plaza, that thing, was not public space, it was just a giant forecourt for the towers. It was just a big placeholder, a, a, a big empty windy place in between the towers, and the towers themselves were really extraordinarily dehumanizing. You could not go anywhere near them and not feel insignificant. It's the reverse of what you think of great buildings doing, in which you feel empowered. You, you, you feel important. Even in St. Peter's, in which you feel this big, you, you feel connected with something larger than life. But you don't feel subjugated and diminished as the, as the towers did. So there are all of these associations flying around as people are now trying to figure out what to do. Uh, you'll have the fun of seeing how we come to terms with the thought that this should represent where we work, yes, and increasingly where we live, although at the moment that's not been allowed, and where we play, because there's the thought of culture being part of the mix. And you've, you know that this week will be announced the winner. And I have a hunch, which I'll share with you, what is the winner will be the one that the most powerfully appeals at all of these different levels. Uh, and um, what kind of image would that be? OK, let's look. Uh, now, really new stuff would look like this. I took this out of an uh, architecture school publication recently. Uh, doesn't make any difference which one. But that's what's being taught. That's what's new. Uh, I don't know where it is or what it is or how it would be part of anything. Next, here's another one. Uh, and it's very, I'm sure, very beautiful. Uh, but it, wh what and where, it, what is that? Next, uh, I am on a, <coughs> on a group uh, uh, of, um, what's the word, uh, pro bono professionals who are trying to provide a critical framework for what does happen downtown. I'm not a direct participant. I can speak freely. Uh, I can uh, I, uh, put on my New York New Visions hat. And as a result of all that, I get all these submittals from very earnest people all over the country, all over the world, who keep sending us stuff saying, this is what you should do. None of this is the official, and I could spend a whole evening discussing with you these ideas. But clearly, here is somebody thinking about context and thinking about the height. Next. And inside, his memorial 
is to recreate the towers and a pool of water and that, 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 all the rest. And I'm not sure that each one of those columns isn't numbered to represent somebody or something. Or, next, you get things like that. Or, this, there, there are lots of these guys, really sort of plaintive drawings of people who think they've got the answer. And uh, th this is not the most amazing. So you know, uh, and, and the next slide, these are going to be a little fuzzy uh, because the, they, uh, they're, they're, they're stolen from a <laughs> layers of technology. But you know the think scheme. I'm sorry they're fuzzy. But look at this preposterous idea that you could shape the memory of the towers and say to the world, this is no longer a commercial development. America is better than that. This is America as culture. These are towers of culture. This expresses our values, not as a mercantile society, not as money grubbers, but as people of ideas, as people who care about the arts, etc. And astonishingly enough, you see the top two were to be the memorial site, and the next thing is where the planes entered the two towers. And that you would somehow want to stand there and say, hey, mommy, this is really great. That's where. And then below uh, were to be an opera house or a gallery or whatever. And what's interesting is, if you follow it through, assuming the cost is no object, assuming that it's easy to get there by elevator, assuming that all of that's paid for, assuming you can figure out the egress, and all the rest of that debris, what has this got to do with the city? It's actually anti-urban. It's against people coming together and exchanging life in the street or any other place because everybody's been isolated. It's sort of the ideal gated community suburban mentality about what belongs at the center of a city. Next. What really counts, however, is what happens at street level because nobody's going to build anything up in the air right away anyway. What this whole competition is about is a way to plan the site. And so it's been interesting to see the thoughts about keeping the footprints and finding the other, uh, uh, other layers. And you notice that the streets have been reimagined uh, in some cases in a very strange way. Uh, I mean, at least th this corner bringing you through and on to the World Trade Center could make some sense. But none of this street patterning uh, relates to uh, existing conditions next, et cetera, et cetera. Let's just go through quickly. And here we are at street level. You see, the sites, in addition to everything else, the site slopes four stories from here to here, aside from this being uh, 17 acres and that being seven stories deep. And so that when you try and get to Battery Park City, you uh, have to cross over West Street, which is uh, four stories below. Uh, this point up here on Church Street. Next. Uh, et cetera. Next. Uh, and there you are, the new city. Next. And there's a, this is, I'm sorry to show this this way because it's quite a beautiful image. Uh, I mean, in terms of, of the poetry of, of physical shape making, it's, it's a knockout. But think of what it represents in this uh, whole business of making a city. Next. Now, Liebskin had some basic ideas, and look how rooted they are in the place, and look how rooted they are in memory. The first, of course, is the hole, that you would actually keep the hole and the raw nastiness of that place as part of the finished solution. Uh, it's a nasty thing to do. It's awful, uh, the, the slurry wall that holds it all up, and quite impractical, because the wall can't stay in its current condition. It has to be reinforced or it's going to fail. How do you do that? If you reinforce it on the outside, uh, it's all but impossible because of the surrounding buildings. If you reinforce it on the inside with buttresses and a new framework, then of course the walls disappeared. So it, it, it's not at all clear how to make that idea work. Plus, if the hole is seven stories deep, you can't it's not very pleasant down there. <laughs> it's not very nice to want to be a part of it. But his idea isn't making a 
a pretty place anyway. His idea is to get you into the rough and ready aspect of what happened. And there are now proposals to pull up the bottom of the hole and get some buses underneath so that there's a place to put the tourists next. Then there are all of these uh, lines that uh, illustrate uh, at part of his architecture out to uh, lines of force that represent people and their uh, names and dedication next. This business of the two points of light, uh, as the sun moves between the, the time when the first plane hit and the second plane hit, it produces that wedge of light and that that should be commemorated in, in the planning of the site itself so that the actual m movement of, I mean, what is time other than uh, the planet's uh, changing position? Uh, interesting subject, what is time, as we all get older. But uh, clearly, that's a very powerful thought that you see marked in the ground the time in which this all happened. Next. Then there is this promenade that goes around, which is the uh, one that's the, the most suspect because uh, it, it exists in a form up in the middle of the air. Some question as to whether anybody would use it. Next. <coughs> and then there is this wonderful series of buildings which build up in a spiral, uh, which end up on top with this vertical garden. And of course, how tall is it? 1,776 feet tall, 1776, right? So <laughs> it uh, also has in it a, a botanical garden. Next. And there you get some sense uh, of how this works. Now, the interesting thing about this particular scheme is that he doesn't have to do all these buildings. They don't all have to be Liebskin buildings. They could be developed by different people over the course of time, leading to the tallest building there. And of all the schemes, it's the only one that doesn't cast a giant shadow to the east from the uh, tall high rises. Next. And you can see here how the, this major axis of Fulton Street, which is a big deal in the replanning of the city to get something that goes across this part of the city. By and large, nothing goes east-west through lower Manhattan. This would be a, a, a major advance. And here, his idea of taking the existing streets and then using them to create the famous wedge of light. <coughs> and here, the promenade. And there, the pit. And there, are these buildings coming around in a spiral, ending next. Um, more of the same, next. A and again, if Liebskin designed the building, it would look like that. But it isn't necessarily the case that he has to. Here, he's acknowledged the fact that the slurry wall will need some kind of reinforcement on the inside. And he has also given the memorial site a, a location, a place, a context. The memorial designers will be at work in another month. And uh, in six months, they will be selected next, et cetera. Next. So and this is the <laughs> 1776 tower. Um, rising up out of all of the rest of these. Now, w of course, New York being a commercial city, what has to pay for all this is commerce, the marketplace. It isn't going to be a handout from the feds. That money will replace all the infrastructure that was destroyed, but it doesn't create new buildings. Only the marketplace can do that. And so, of course, it has to happen incrementally. And once again, you can imagine this scheme done by uh, several different hands over the course of time, because it'll take 10, 15 years. Next. So there you are. Are you, are, do you have any question in your minds? Do you want to bet who uh, is selected? And, and what's important about the selection is everything that's happening at the ground level. And look how, how extraordinarily dependent upon this whole business of community, memory, access, what have you. Next, the very things that we claim are important for preservation. So uh, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Next, uh, I want you to know <laughs> that, um, th that th these cultural values that, that you're struggling with through these buildings are an essential part of whatever community you choose to live in, work in, be part of. And you're absolutely right to have this stuff on your mind. Not to clone, not to copy, 
not because we want to recreate the 19th century in the 21st century. Now remember, we're in the 21st century. We've got every right to express ourselves in our own way, but it doesn't need to be at the expense of everything that's gone before. This is such a plaintive view for me, because I keep, I see there in my mind's eye what isn't there anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, and this, you are the generation that can figure out the puzzle, the great puzzle that the modernists made for us uh, when they took the past away and said the past doesn't count, the past is irrelevant, we are the future, uh, we have got to figure out how to relate old to new, and new to old. That's our challenge. That's the fun and the joy of my profession. Thanks. <laughs>